Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the 19th Annual Meeting of the Securities and Exchange Commission Historical Society and to today's program, Regulation and Market Structure from ATS to NMS. I'm Dan Gelzer. I'm the chair of the Society's Board of Trustees. And on behalf of the trustees, I'd like to thank everyone, those here in the room, as well as those listening on the uh, live webcast for joining us today. In a few minutes, our distinguished panel will be discussing the evolution of our nation's securities markets during the decade from the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s. But before we be begin the program, I'd like to say a few words about the Historical Society. The SEC Historical Society's mission is to preserve and advance knowledge of the history of financial regulation. We accomplish that mission through our virtual museum and archive, which you can access at www.seChistorical.org. The virtual museum includes galleries devoted to specific topics, papers, oral histories, archive webcasts of programs like the one we're having today, photos, and other materials that chronicle the development of our nation's securities markets and of financial regulation over the years. Today's program is part of the construction of a new gallery devoted to securities market structure that will be opening in December of this year. Unlike a physical museum, the Society's Virtual Museum has a collection that's always available, 24 hours a day, free of charge to anyone, anywhere in the world, with internet access. If you haven't already done so, I urge everyone here in the room and everyone listening to the webcast to visit the Virtual Museum. I'm sure you'll find it uh, useful and informative and, and maybe even entertaining in, in some ways. Uh, whether you're a student, a professor, a researcher, a practitioner, a regulator, or just someone who's curious about the financial markets and how they came to be the way that they are, please take a tour of the museum. I, I should stress that the SEC Historical Society isn't affiliated with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We're an independent, nonprofit organization, and we depend on donations from individuals and organizations that support our, our mission. Uh, however, despite the fact that we aren't affiliated with the SEC, much of the museum's focus is on the extraordinary men and women who have served at the Commission over the last eight decades. The virtual museum includes 228 oral histories, many of them with former commissioners and staff members. These interviews, I think, provide remarkable insight, unavailable anywhere else, into the challenges that those who worked at the agency over the years have faced and how they met those challenges and into their successes and occasionally their setbacks in doing so. Many of the stories that you'll hear in the oral histories have resonance for, resonance for issues that the Commission is dealing with today, so I, I hope you'll sample them. Each year the Society holds an event like this one in early June to mark the passage on June 6, 1934, of the Securities Exchange Act. The 34 Act, of course, created the Securities and Exchange Commission and transferred responsibility for administering the original piece of securities regulation, the Securities Act of 1933, to the new SEC. As is our tradition to commemorate the Commission's 84th birthday, please join us after the program for ice cream in the, uh, in the lobby. On the subject of SEC birthdays, next year will mark the 85th anniversary of the Commission's birth. As we've done for uh, milestones like that in the past, the Society is planning to have a special commemorative program next year and also a dinner. So please mark your calendars for the afternoon and evening of Monday, June 3rd, 2019, and stay tuned for additional details about that event. Before turning to our market structure panel, I want to thank the Commission and staff for once again hosting this annual event here at the SEC. In particular, we're honored that Commissioner Hester Peirce is here with us. 
on behalf of the commission and has agreed to uh, share some remarks. Prior to swearing in, in this January, Commissioner Peirce was a senior research fellow and director of the Financial Markets Working Group at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. She previously worked on Senator Richard Shelby's Senate Banking Committee staff and prior to that as, as counsel for SEC Commissioner Paul Atkins and as a staff attorney in the Division of Investment Management. Commissioner Peirce earned her BA in Economics at Case Western Reserve University and her JD from Yale University. Commissioner, thank you again for taking the time to be with us today and let me turn the podium over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to all of you for being here today. And it's really an honor to be here to uh, welcome you to this event. I think it'll be an excellent event. Uh, financial regulation is in itself fascinating, but I think looking at the history makes it even more fascinating. And today we have um, the best panel that you could imagine to talk about market structure issues, so I'm very much looking forward to their discussion. I think to really understand ATS and NMS, you need to go back even further uh, and need to go back to the 75 Act amendments. And um, I've had the privilege of looking into the SEC Historical Society archives for information about how we got to where we are today. And among other things, I ran across an interview with um, Roberta Carmel, who actually is here with us today. So I, I got her permission to quote from that interview. Um, and this is what she said at the time. Uh, she was here when the 75 Act amendments had been passed and the SEC was trying to figure out what exactly to do with this mandate. So she says she remembers having a rather strange conversation one day with the head of the enforcement division at the SEC, Stanley Sporkin, who said, Roberta, I don't know what we're gonna do about this national market system. He said, I think we should establish some sort of government agency like Comstat that should build the national market system. And Roberta responded, Stanley, and then what? Shoot it into space? I believe that market structure, this is again, Roberta Carmel speaking. She says, I believe market structure had to come from the industry. The government could not dictate what the market should be. Even if that was good policy, which I did not think it was, the government couldn't do it. And I, I have to say that I um, find some, some comfort in those remarks because now sitting here today and looking at national market structure and all the rules that we have to support it, I find myself asking that question again and wondering whether we should shoot it into space and start all over again. Uh, but in any event, we're gonna hear today from people who know a tremendous amount about a key part of the history, and I look forward to that discussion, and, and it's being moderated by Kenneth Durr, who is a graduate of Kent State in the great state of Ohio. Uh, he got his master's and doctorate from American University He's now the Vice President of History Services at History Associates. He oversees the productions of books, online histories, and oral history programs. And I will say that even though I've not met him, uh, I feel that I know him personally because I've listened to so many hours of his interviews on the SEC Historical Society's website. Um, he just does a, a fantastic job at drawing people out, drawing people's stories out, putting things in context. Um, so I just wanna thank you for the work that you've done. I know that I personally have benefited and I am sure that many others have as well. So thank you very much and we look forward to the discussion. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Commissioner Purse. I, I appreciate that. Our mission today is to uh, explore the development of, uh, and the, of and the regulation of the uh, equities markets during the pivotal years between regulation ATS and reg NMS. And to do that, it's my honor to introduce three former directors of the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets. Richard G. Ketchum was director from 1984 to 1990. Dr. Richard R. Lindsay was a director from 1995 to 1998 and Commissioner Annette Nazareth was director from 1999 to 2005. 
So we're going to put all of that institutional and personal knowledge to work uh, by talking a little bit about not only that period from ATS to NMS, but we're going to go back to the set the baseline a little bit too. And Rick, I'm going to throw it down to you um, to talk a little bit about the 75 Acts Amendments and how we emerged from that, how the, uh, the commission emerged from that. And we started moving in the direction of uh, actually realizing that mandate. Sure, thanks, Ken, and it's great to see those of my colleagues in the audience. Um, okay, this is sort of the first 15 years of national market system in five minutes, whether you're ready or not. Uh, first thing to understand is that, that obviously the 75 Act Amendments and the particular part we'll talk about today, which is Section 11 Cap A, uh, were not simple. Uh, the Congress set forth a variety of objectives, some of which were contradictory. Uh, some of which were, were, uh, were to, there were broad consensus of, such as increased transparency, increase, increasing the economic efficient execution of transactions, and then a range of things that uh, were in the BI of the holder from the standpoint of encouraging competition uh, and at the same time encouraging that competition while at the same time in, in, enhancing interaction of orders. And we'll hear over periods of decades the Commission struggle in meeting particularly those two desirable ends, which uh, often aren't simple. I think that to understand the Commission's first 15 years in this, I think you first have to step back, completely forget everything you know about existing markets, and remember what markets look like in 1975 and really pretty much look like in 1990. Because effectively you were, you were in an environment in 75 in which th there were two types of market structures. The first was an exchange market structure completely dominated by the New York Stock Exchange, except for small listed securities, which was completely dominated by the American Stock Exchange. Much of the fragmentation that had occurred earlier because of, because of uh, fixed commissions disappeared, uh, and, and New York had the vast majority of the order flow. In addition, this was a very manually intensive environment. Most of the trading occurred in New York, much of it was face to face. To the extent there was any electronic order flow uh, from the standpoint of small orders, it was done sent to a printer. Uh, and again, even in, up to 1987, it was sent to pretty much the very same printers. Uh, on the NASDAQ market side, uh, you, you had an environment that was purely telephone by telephone trading in which market makers put out quotes uh, and in early times in which e those who advise retail investors didn't even have access to anything besides a summary of those quotations. So in that, and I guess the last piece is, is that while Congress and the Commission saw the enormous potential that has occurred from the standpoint of technology, this was a very different environment from a technology time, a time when business continuity plans was a nice theory in, in business schools, but not actually implemented by very many people managing computer systems. Uh, and we're, while the ability to build uh, an electronic system that would pull all order flow together was possible, the risks involved in that uh, were very significant. So what did the Commission do during that time? Let's talk about it into three pieces. The first piece is the exchange market environment, uh, where the Commission tried to take a variety of what I'll call building block steps that started even before the 75 Act amendments but completed afterwards with respect to creating a consolidated transaction reporting system. Remembering at this point, people pretty much outside of traders had only access to primary market or New York Stock Exchange information. It moved to that to a consolidated quotation system uh, that, in, that ensured a best bid and offer would be available from all the marketplaces. That, that set of rulemaking also put, put in place a requirement that firms, uh, that market makers putting out quotes had to be firm for those quotes, something that I'm sure we'll return to uh, and that drove a variety of SEC actions down the road. And the third piece, again, recognizing that even when the information was there, people chose to only look at the primary market information, was a vendor display rule that, again, tried to ensure that that information was, was available in a variety of places. Next step was building a rudimentary linkage system, uh, fundamentally a compromise because of the risks in building fully electronic systems called the Intermarket Trading System, or ITS. Uh, and combining that over time with a price protection rule generally referred to as trade-through rules uh, that basically ensured that, that uh, participants in one marketplace could not in ignore 
at least completely ignore, a better quote in, in another marketplace. Now, the way ITS worked is very different than what you use today with respect to automatic executions. ITS essentially resulted in an order being sent, let's say, to the New York Stock Exchange from the Pacific Stock Exchange, and then uh, a requirement that, the, the, that they respond to that order in somewhat short of a lifetime, but usually a minute, uh, and r raising a variety of challenges with respect to it. But if you will, the simplest thing to understand the minimal impact from a competitive standpoint is it always allowed the receiving market to better the price. Uh, and, and in most circumstances, when you're allowed to better, better the price, you will. Uh, and and so the, the ability to really attract order flow was limited. Uh, now that did result in the first competitive breakthrough, which was regional exchanges being able to provide automatic execution systems for small customer orders. Again, something that will appear down the road. Second piece was NASDAQ. NASDAQ in the, in the late 70s and early 80s was unrecognizable from the standpoint of the day. A pure telephone marketplace. Uh, in which the information to advisors for retail investors included an average of the quotes. You actually didn't get to find out what the best quote was. Uh, so over a period of time, the Commission took steps to require last sale reporting in NASDAQ securities, didn't exist before, uh, require that, that the best bid and offer be, be available to retail advisors, uh, and then steadily over time took steps in, in something called the Manning decision and actions afterwards to restrict the ability for market makers to trade in front of their customers. Last piece that came after the, uh, the crash of 87 was the SO system, NASDAQ's effort to deal with the backing away or, or uh, problems that occurred during the, during the crash and provide an automatic execution system that we'll talk about in later chapters uh, resulted in some interesting opportunities for, for day traders and momentum traders. Last piece I'll mention and shut up uh, is that probably the most significant thing the Commission did in that time, yet at the same time uh, uh, didn't seem that at the time, was the fact that it allowed uh, alternative market structures to develop. Uh, with the Cincinnati Stock Exchange, would oper operate a com composite limit order book. With respect to Instanet, which gradually evolved from, a, from an institutional fourth market system into an effective composite limit order book as well. And probably the most important things the Commission did that set up a great deal of what Rich will talk next about is that it allowed those system, in systems like Instanet not to register as exchanges but to operate as broker-dealers. A very messy way of encouraging competition, but basically the only way of doing it at a time when the Commission had very little exemptive authority. Ken, I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, that was a wonderful five-minute tutorial, thanks. Um, a any of our other participants want to add anything to that context? No, it just sounds like it's so ancient. I was going to ask if everybody, you know, walked a mile to get to the exchange when they, <laughs> in the snow. I mean, <laughs> uphill both ways. But <laughs> no, but we, we did walk the mile to Kelly's to draw uh, uh, the variety of things. And it, it should be noted, in that very time, speaking of Kelly's, where most of those things were designed, the Commission requested comment on all the things in one way or another that were later done. Requested comment on things like a composite limit order book, order by order routing, or an order display rule, the removal of off board trading, indeed approved, uh, proposed from the standpoint of removal of off board trading restrictions. So the issues were there. The challenges were the lack of, uh, of support uh, for the reasons Commissioner Pierce properly re recognized in her, her opening remarks, uh, and the, the, the risks involved in a fully electronic system at the time. As a historian, one of the things that I'm always interested in is the role not just of how one thing led to another, but the, 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 the role of chance. And we had this little thing that, that occurred uh, called the Odd 8 scandal, which kind of blew NASDAQ apart a little bit um, and had a big uh, in influence on the way the national market system was developed. And by, in, uh, and also on the regulation. And Rich, you were in, in this, this seat when this happened. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, to just broaden out a little bit of what Rick said uh, a moment ago, there was this, uh, so I want to capture two things. One was the Manning Rule, which was mentioned. What you should understand is that the Manning Rule was actually the result of a lawsuit that was brought against uh, NASDAQ market makers because they were trading ahead of their customer orders. The, the second thing is that for 
decades, people had talked about the competitive uh, dealer system uh, for NASDAQ market makers, which turns out wasn't really particularly competitive uh, because while uh, as the NASDAQ electronic connections developed, they didn't actually have to trade with each other. They just posted their quotes. So if you were a customer, even after the Manning rule, and you were, uh, you wanted a, to trade at the best price in the market, you would submit it to whichever market maker was there that you were doing business with, but it may never ever get executed because it didn't get routed to some other market maker. It got held by the market maker uh, that you sent it to to begin with. And I want to underscore, you know, we can talk about history, but I want to also talk a little bit about kind of the logic and, and certain things that happen. And one of those is that intermediaries like to hold order flow. They like to control the order flow. And that's even true today. And a lot of what we were doing uh, during the intervening time periods we're going to talk about was to try to make that order flow more accessible and more competitive. People like to hold order flow, hold order flow because if they can segment it and they can say, okay, these are Unin I'll call it uninformed investors, and these are informed investors. If I can dump the informed investors someplace else and trade with the uninformed investors, then I can actually make more money. Uh, so to get rid of that kind of asymmetric component that might be embedded in order flow, people like to push away certain types of orders. And uh, the, the SO system brought that about, but what also happened, uh, and I'll come back to SOs in a moment, what also happened was the odd eights uh, scandal that uh, was mentioned. Um, and in this, what market makers, was actually a two level pricing convention, but we don't need to get into all of the details, but essentially market makers avoided the odd eighth. Uh, so they quoted only the even eighths. So zero, a quarter, a half, uh, skipping, the, uh, skipping the odd eights. Now, that was actually a mechanism of, uh, let's say, tacit collusion. Uh, the, that this was enforced within the market making community. If somebody broke that, they were called, berated, threatened, uh, you know, to some extent maybe uh, pressured in, in other ways. And that brought about both kind of the SEC enforcement action, the 21A against the NASDAQ market, but it also brought about the uh, Justice Department action against the NASDAQ market makers to try to resolve and break that particular pricing convention. Um, the reason that that pricing convention could be supported from an economic standpoint, you generally would say you can't support collusion because there's always an incentive for somebody to break. And just getting berated and sworn at on the telephone may not be enough to make you continue to do it. But the reason that it could kind of support itself was the fact that there was this entity out there known as Instanet. And in Instanet, which at the time billed itself as a crossing network for institutions, was about 80% NASDAQ market makers uh, crossing with each other. And the reason that they could do that is that if you combined the order flow that was in Instanet, NASDAQ market maker order flow, with the NASDAQ order flow from their order flow, you actually didn't have an avoidance of odd eighths. So they could kind of support the convention by trading in the odd eighths in Instanet. And that was admittedly blind as to who was on the other side, but as it turns out, it was mostly uh, uh, NASDAQ market makers that were using that. And that was a way that kind of supported it. So that sets part of the stage for what the commission felt that it needed to fix at that point in time. Did you want to jump in? I, oh. I was going to say what I, what I find compelling about this is, is that the 11A uh, objectives were so instrumental in being able to address these issues. I mean, even if you had situations that didn't involve fraud, the fact of the matter is, I mean, today we so take for granted price transparency. I mean, when Rick is talking about, you know, forcing exchanges to, uh, you know, to show their, their best prices, this was not something that, uh, needless to say, they were uh, inclined to do. I mean, there's a tremendous value, as Rich, Rich implied, in, in sort of keeping these orders and this information to yourself. And so having 
these national market system authorities to that that say the commission has authority to further price transparency that it that it has the ability to further these notions of economic economically efficient execution of of orders i mean that that is where the ability and the, the sort of laser focus on these issues that I think has made our market so strong really originated from, just to put it in that context. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say briefly, I, I, I think Rich summarized this perfectly. I mean, the, the incentives for wider spreads in the NASDAQ market were, were artificial in a variety of ways. Uh, it, it also was impacted in the fact that all retail orders were executed by the market making, in the market making community, either internalizing their own order flow uh, or with respect to contracts to receive from that standpoint. So it certainly worked better if the spreads were a quarter uh, or a half as opposed to an eighth, much less these days a penny. Uh, and the, the other piece that, that I think played in this, that Rich referred to, is the frustration that existed that it's difficult to necessarily fully capture today uh, over the SOS momentum trading. Uh, SOS was initially developed as a retail system, but was early on discovered as a, a remarkably good momentum trading or day trading system, uh, particularly in a time frame, just as you can analogize in the early days of high frequency trading uh, before the liquidity providers developed the technology to be able to respond uh, and manage their quotes better. They had no quote management capabilities at that time of so. So there was enormous frustration about that, that activity, uh, which was reflected in a variety of ways and how they responded when they received orders in another system called SelectNet. Uh, but also, I, I think, also contributed to, uh, because of the exposure they felt in a world where they couldn't manage their quotes, uh, another incentive to, to not be terribly aggressive in quote, quote competition. So SOS was a small order execution system, and in theory, it was an execution system where a small order could be sent into a NASDAQ market maker. At that time, NASDAQ market makers had to quote 10,000 shares, was it? Or 5,000. It was either 5,000 or 10,000 shares as a minimum, but you could send in an order smaller than that that would essentially get executed automatically, except it turned out that it didn't. Uh, if you were a customer of the uh, market maker, then they would execute your order. If you were coming from someplace else, that somebody they deemed wasn't a customer, then they would try not to execute your order. Uh, so those, those people became characterized as SOS bandits. Uh, most of you are too young to remember that term. Uh, but those SOS bandits also became what are later, many of those firms transformed themselves into high frequency trading firms. So uh, using the same type of strategy of very fast trading activity to try to capture mispricings or aberrant pricings perhaps uh, in the marketplace. Uh, so that all of that was kind of setting the, the stage. And I wanted to go back before I forget one thing that uh, the net had mentioned was that this idea of controlling wasn't new. Uh, if you think all the way back to the Buttonwood Tree Agreement, in the Buttonwood Tree Agreement, people signed an agreement that they were going to preferentially trade with each other and not share those prices with anybody outside the agreement. Uh, and the idea is that if you can control that information, you can generally make more money. Uh, you know, in early days of the New York Stock Exchange, they painted the windows black, they prohibited phones, they didn't allow telegraphs on the floor of the exchange. Everything to try to keep the information private, because with private information you actually can trade and make more, more money. So I think that kind of sets the stage. Uh, the commission brought the 20, uh, had the 21A enforcement action against NASDAQ. Uh, the Justice Department brought their enforcement action against NASDAQ market makers. And then it became the task uh, that was, was assigned to me to say, make, this, make sure that this can never happen again. And the way that we went about doing that was what's known as the order handling rules. And in the order handling rules, basically what we did was to say that quotes, firm quotes, quotes that could be executed against, things that could immediately be executable, had to be displayed in the marketplace. Uh, a few little wrinkles, they had to be less than 10,000 shares, et cetera. But, uh, and 
an institution could choose to do something different, but the, the idea was that you wanted all quotes reflected in the, in the marketplace. And we had this entity, Instanet, uh, that existed that for all intents and purposes was an exchange. Uh, for all intents and purposes was an exchange and was being used to trade fairly actively, but not revealed to the public. So as part of uh, the order handling rules, we created something that was called an ECN, Electronic Communications Network. And that was meant to, to capture something like Instanet and around that time, Island, uh, to make sure that their quotes were incorporated into the national market quote system so that they could at least be seen, if not necessarily accessed by somebody who didn't be belong to either one of those, uh, those entities. So the electronic communications network was because we knew we didn't want to force, Instanet had been operating since 1968 under a no action letter from the SEC. Uh, it had been operating since 68. We didn't want to force them to register as an exchange and take on all of the burdens that an exchange had but we wanted to give them the opportunity to continue to operate as a broker dealer and to run uh, their marketplace as long as the quotes were, into the, were included in the market. Well, let me just, I, I, th I think Rick, you might have brushed over it earlier, but that instant no action letter, uh, I think you had some involvement with that. Can you tell us a little bit about the significance yeah, who, there? Who would sign something that lawless? Um, <laughs> Sure. I, I mean, they, there were a variety of interpretations the Commission take, took during that time, most with respect to systems that are, are best left nameless and forgotten. Uh, Instanet being the most significant one, because over, over a period of time in, in Instanet, uh, through a guy named Bill Lupian, uh, evolved from being a strictly institutional system to recognize that, that the only order-driven systems only work when you have liquidity, and liquidity tends to come on a continuous basis only if you find ways to include the sell side or the dealers in one way or another. And Instanet, as Rich said, for all the reasons and in the inefficiencies, particularly in the NASDAQ market to a lesser extent in, in the exchange market, I uh, had a tremendous opportunity. A series of institutions began to very actively use Instanet to feed, feed their order flow uh, and became quite uh, outspoken about the, the results from a statistical standpoint, and the, and the results were, uh, were very powerful. Uh, so that, that, that led lots of folks not to be super fans of Instanet, even, even as they started to evolve. And as Rich said, this, is, this was a difficult issue uh, because Instanet, as a consolidated limit order book, essentially uh, maintain much of the uh, the appearances of an exchange, albeit not all of it. And I, and I think the only way to describe those interpretations was a pretty conscious effort, uh, albeit I, I wouldn't say we would take credit for saying we thought Instanet was going to become something huge, but conscious effort of recognizing that the ability to deliver competition across exchanges was challenging, uh, and the ability to make it simpler for electronic systems to be built uh, and to compete for order flow outside of the exchange environment uh, was desirable. Uh, and, and I think that uh, you know, it, it was a time where there was very little uh, exemptive authority in the 34 Act, uh, and I think it was a, a conscious effort to at least s stretch or be, be very flexible and have a very narrow interpretation of what an exchange is. Not something regulators usually choose to do, but, uh, but in this case I think it was critical to encourage competition. So some of those same questions must have come up after the order handling rules, and you've got these ECNs emerging, and there's the question of whether they're an exchange or not an exchange, and all of that. And is this what, what leads us to Reg ATS? Well, there were, there were a couple of things that led to Reg ATS. So at the same time, once we allowed the existence of something, at least a regulatory existence of something like the ECNs, there was uh, the beginning of a proliferation of ECNs. Um, and so you also have to think about that this, that was before these things existed. Uh, you know, we had little Motorola flip phones from the commission at the time. Uh, but the, the, the fact that you could do so 
much with uh, technology at the time. More and more things came. Bill Lupien came back with another idea, Optimark, uh, something that never succeeded. Uh, you know, there was the Arizona Stock Exchange. There was a whole slew of new ideas and new ways that people were trying to do things. And, and our view uh, was that really what you wanted was you wanted competition in the marketplace. And that competition uh, really regulated markets much better than the SEC could. It wasn't, we didn't view it as our job to design the market. We viewed it as our job to try to allow more competition to exist. Now, sometimes to make competition, to let competition exist, you actually have to remove the barriers to competition that exist because many of the laws and regulations really reinforce the incumbents in the marketplace. Uh, the fact that the New York Stock Exchange had about a 90% market share kind of indicates that. Today, I think their market share is uh, hovering around 30%. Uh, and that's really the result of competition, not the result of the SEC saying, well, send your order someplace else. So it's really trying to provide that and to let more things blossom. What happened with Reg TS uh, after the order handling rules were done and we had created ECNs, it uh, dawned on me that there was a loophole. And that loophole was any company, and at the time I thought of Microsoft, could essentially set up an exchange to trade its own shares without any registration, without any control over the trading of those shares, without any transparency, without any access, they, they could just set up a market themselves and do that. Uh, and that I th thought was probably a, 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 a real possibility at the time. So part of what ATS was, was to make sure that we closed that loophole, that we made sh sure that if somebody wanted to do that, if a company wanted to do that, that would be fine, but they would at least operate under a certain uh, kind of light regulatory system. Uh, there was a, another couple of things that were embedded in Reg ATS. Part of the purpose of Reg ATS was to define what an exchange is. Because that had never really been defined in the law. As an economist and as uh, somebody who did market microstructure, the design of security markets, I had what I viewed as uh, an exchange. I had a pretty good idea of that. But, you know, I set a group of lawyers to work on defining what an exchange was. Um, uh, she's not here, but uh, uh, Belinda Blaine uh, chaired that group, and I remember they went and worked for about a month uh, or so, and then they came back and sat down across from me and had two very thick binders, which they pushed across the table and said, this is everything that's ever been written about what an exchange is. And I said, great, and I pushed them back, and I said, now tell me what an exchange is. So they went away again. Uh, and I think in Reg ATS, uh, it probably described fairly closely at that time what we think constitutes an exchange and what the oversight of an exchange needs to be. Now, what we wanted to do was not force everybody to walk down the exchange registration path with all of the weight that's associated with that regulatory burden, but we wanted to say, okay, you can be a broker dealer, you have to provide certain things, you know, fairness, access, transparency, were essentially the, the, the criteria that we wanted to apply, much the same criteria, of course, from the 75 Act Amendments. So the idea was to, to make sure that if people wanted to build things and try new things, they could. In that, we also did a couple of other things with, uh, with uh, Reg ATS. We allowed exchanges to also build ATSs and to be able to innovate and try new exchange constructions or, or, or techniques. Uh, and at the same time, uh, what Reg ATS did was it allowed exchanges to privatize. Uh, that was one of the objectives. Uh, Arthur had. Arthur Levitt was chairman at the time, and Arthur had been uh, the chairman of an exchange, uh, and his view was that uh, exchanges were bound by their floor, that they couldn't do the right thing often because of the floors and the fact that the floor controlled things. So the idea was to try to at least provide a pathway 
for exchanges to privatize if they wanted to. So that was embedded in uh, ATS also. Let's cast our minds back a little bit and, and talk about some of the other things going on in that period. Um, we've got decimalization. Um, what, what are some of the other contextual things that we should t think about as we uh, talk about the transition from ATS and moving onward? Well, I would certainly say, I mean, ATS, and I, I think Rich did a, a fabulous summary, um, really did transform the markets, but it very much transformed what was the NASDAQ market, essentially. And um, uh, what we had uh, and, and what so, sort of led up to uh, Reg NMS was that there were still a lot of impediments to innovation uh, in the listed market, um, and in particular, you know, we had a lot of legacy rules that really were written at a time when we had um, floor-based exchanges and, uh, you know, very similar models and, uh, you know, markets that were not anywhere near as electronic as what we were now seeing in the NASDAQ market. Um, and so uh, I have to credit the Commission with um, realizing that this had to be addressed because you could not have these rules stay in place and thwart innovation. And, and much of what we've heard today is, were attempts by the Commission to encourage innovation in the markets and encourage competition among markets, uh, but at the same time, you know, keeping uh, in mind the other uh, national market system uh, mandates, including encouraging order interaction. So uh, what happened after Reg ATS was, um, and I do credit Arthur for being one of the people who really focused on this, was, you know, that Rule 390 um, had, the New York Stock Exchange Rule 390 had prohibited their members and their affiliates from uh, affecting transactions in New York Stock Exchange securities um, off a national securities exchange. And of course, as Rich said, if New York Stock Exchange had 90 percent of that market, it pretty much meant you can't affect transactions in New York Stock Exchange securities anywhere but on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, that was a, a little bit of an impediment for people like Instanet trying to get into that market and for over-the-counter traders to, um, to get into that market. Um, and so we recognized that um, it, although there had been lots of focus, I think even in Rich's, uh, Rick's time to Rule 390 and coming up with some exceptions, the bottom line was it was still a major competitive uh, impediment. And so we wanted to focus on what would happen if we uh, essentially forced the New York Stock Exchange to repeal that rule. Uh, they did repeal it, but I wouldn't say it, they were happy about it. Um, but we wanted uh, basically folks to comment on and understand uh, through the concept release that we did that um, we understood that there was something that came from a rule like that. And that was that you had much greater interaction of orders, competition among orders, in a single location. And that what that does is it furthers, uh, you know, order interaction and therefore uh, more competitive pricing. Um, now that again is uh, in competition with another uh, one of the 11A desires, which is to encourage uh, competition among markets. So you sort of, they're, they're really competing goals. Um, so what we asked in the concept release was, is it possible to have a system where we both encourage competing markets um, and would do away essentially with Rule 390, but also um, keep in mind this, this ability to, or this desire to have order interaction. And that's where we talked about a number of different ways one could do that from, um, you know, with the, obviously the most, uh, the way to really bring orders together and the, the most dreaded one, which we would never have done, would be the uh, central limit order book. But, uh, but what we ended up with was something that, you know, uh, ultimately uh, required greater linkage, you know. Of was, the was this the fragmentation release? This is the fragmentation comment? release. Uh, the fragmentation <laughs> release was the, the release that talked about Rule 390 and discussed uh, the fact that, you know, um, another, Basically, another term for competition is fragmentation in, in the market. The more, the more market competition you have, 
the more you've, you've split orders among different venues and therefore you have fragmented markets, is there a possibility that you can have greater competition but also encourage greater order interaction through other means? I just add one point to this, and that summarizes that beautifully and sort of sets up for where the world goes. But one interesting event that comes out of Reg ATS and the, and the environment, or to some degree the order display rule and the environment that, that encouraged the flourishing of, of ATS or ECN systems, uh, was the innovation that Archipelago invented, which, which for the, for the sort of resulted in their becoming the third major uh, ATS during the time of order by order routing. Uh, and the first time uh, a system, albeit in a limited way, way uh, took advantage of some of the changes with ATS, et cetera, that at least, we'll talk about access fees later, but at least limited access fees and made, made access uh, and some of the anti-competitive things that have been done in access less viable before. And ARCA for the first time demonstrated with that the, the popularity uh, and the effectiveness uh, of providing a single place that would route orders to the best price no matter where it was. Uh, and, and that I think is interesting as much as anything else because it's one more precursor to rate and MS that we'll talk about later. Uh, another interesting thing is that Rule 390 that was mentioned by Annette actually probably was more of the impetus for how we got to decimalization. Um, you know, so three Rule 390 basically said if you are a New York Stock Exchange member, you cannot trade a certain list of securities, securities before a certain year, any place other than on the New York Stock Exchange. So that provided an opportunity for what were called third market makers. They, they would take New York Stock Exchange stocks and they would uh, cross them or, or trade them and provide uh, liquidity other than the New York Stock Exchange. Um, the New York Stock Exchange, of course, didn't like that as more and more of these uh, uh, third market makers started uh, started uh, doing business, and they also paid for order flow, and they did a whole bunch of other things that you know appeared in the press in various versions uh, during that time. Uh, but there was one particular very large third market maker uh, who uh, was calling me and complaining about the fact that the New York Stock Exchange, which at that time also had regulatory, uh, it, it had a regulatory arm, that was before it had been uh, merged uh, with NASDAR, uh, and uh, complained that Grasso was using that regulatory power to try to force people to stop sending order flow to them, and wanted to basically complain about that. And, uh, and he said to me, if, if Grasso doesn't stop, I'm going to break the eighth. Uh, and, the commission, of course, would appreciate the eighth being broken at that point in time. And I said, well, that would be a great thing to, t to, to tell Dick, why don't you call him up and do that? Uh, so he did, and a few weeks later, this person called me back and said, you know, Dick still hasn't stopped, they're still doing it, I'm gonna break the eighth tomorrow. And I said, go ahead. Well, that person was Bernie Madoff, uh, you know, yes, the same Bernie. I was wondering if we were going to get to yeah. the name at some point. <laughs> uh, I thought you probably knew the name. So, uh, the, the same Bernie Madoff that, uh, you know, later conducted a huge Ponzi scheme. But nonetheless, he broke the eighth, went to sixteenths, or teenies as they were called, uh, and the markets went wild. Uh, all of the exchanges went crazy because, you know, they couldn't, they said, well, we have to do this. Of course, within a week, they were all trading in 16th. Uh, and, you know, that, of course, led to the eventual uh, adoption of, of decimals. I, I remember being a, on the floor of the Boston Stock Exchange talking to the chairman of Boston where he was saying, well, they can never do decimals. Decimals are too complicated. And we were standing next to a specialist post and he had eight, sixteenths, eighths, et cetera, et cetera, and then conversion to decimals because that's how he could think about them <laughs> rather than keep track of how many sixteenths were in something. Uh, and decimals kind of started down its long, tortuous path that actually, I think, ended up happening under that. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, w and was legislated as well. I mean, we had a lot of pressure from Congress to implement decimals. And after all the complaining, I think it actually went 
quite smoothly. I don't think that was any, it was clearly again a situation where um, I think it uh, brought a lot of fear into the hearts of, of uh, uh, market professionals because it was clear that uh, spreads would narrow if you move to pennies from eighths or even sixteenths. But um, nevertheless, I think it um, it worked quite well. I mean, then, as you know, under uh, Reg NMS, then the issue was, what about sub pennies? Is you know, and and even with pennies, I mean, you know, it, it did uh, uh, change some behaviors. It, Rich mentioned Dick Grasso, who was the uh, head of the New York Stock Exchange, he always said, you know, that uh, if we go to pennies, I mean, mark my words, it's going to work out better for uh, the market makers and the specialists because they'll be able to step ahead for a penny and they bettered the price. And uh, and so that was, there was some concern about that, but it was a much bigger concern that you could step ahead for a sub penny. And so one of the issues that, and also just the complexity in the markets of moving to sub pennies. So one of the things that Reg NMS addressed was that trading would be in pennies, but not that, but not sub pennies um, for that reason. I mean, the other, um, uh, again, we had, uh, as we mentioned before, you know, with the uh, New York Stock Exchange, uh, well, in, in the uh, exchange space, the, um, this notion of best price or best execution, uh, the, they had a linkage, the uh, intermarket trading system, which was a very, very clunky, system where if you were on one exchange and the New York, let's say, was uh, posting a better price, you had to go and try to uh, attempt to get that price or match it. And if you, if you sent the order to the New York, you sent it through this very clunky system and it was a single, sort of a single point of failure, a single pipe, so to speak. And if um, and you gave the New York a very nice period of time, eventually it was they got it all the way down to something like 30 seconds, but you can imagine today telling someone to wait 30 seconds to give another market the ability to tell you whether or not they would deign to trade with you at that price. And so, um, you know, that, that obviously had to go uh, in, this, in this new, very highly electronic environment. So um, the, uh, one of the things we did uh, in the access rule portion of Reg NMS was to say that, you know, you no longer we're going to use this ITS system, but that we authorize private linkages because obviously technology at that point uh, would permit that. Um, we also limited access fees. Of course, that's still an issue that Hester and others will <laughs> continue to have to address because it, it um, continues to, um, uh, to be a challenge, but we limited access fees to um, uh, three-tenths of a cent per share, which really was sort of punting because that was, it just happened to be what the market was bearing at the time uh, and was uh, was basically ad adopted and retained in order to protect um, uh, the ECNs who at that time were making their money off these access fees. Ironically, today it's the exchanges who charge the access fees and not the uh, other market participants. Um, and then we said that the SROs had to have, you know, policies and procedures to, um, uh, to prohibit uh, locked and crossed markets. Um, as I mentioned, we had the subpenny rule. That was a, a second element of Reg NMS. The other was um, the market data rules. Again, uh, another area that uh, never never goes away. I think I think one of the um, one of the themes of this panel will be that many of the issues will somehow are always with us. Um, market data uh, was just as controversial uh, then as now. Um, one of the problems that the commission saw was that there were distortions in how the market data was um, allocated among markets uh, because it was allocated by the number of trades as opposed to the number of uh, shares and, and um, so it was encouraging bad activity like wash sales in order to create trades so that markets could get um, higher uh, market data fees. Uh, but you may recall that during this period the SEC also had um, you know, an advisory committee on market data. There, they, as as today, there was there were debates over whether uh, it paid to have a single consolidator system or whether um, there'd be multiple competing consolidators. Uh, with ultimately, I think the commission deciding that it is somewhat of a utility function and very important. Uh, market data was so key to trading that we wanted to make sure that there was a lot of integrity and, and uniformity in 
in trade reporting um, and uh, the, the information that was distributed. Um, that said, um, you know, as I said, it, it, it remains uh, an issue that uh, we're still dealing with. And then, of course, the big issue and the one that um, uh, got everybody's attention was uh, what was called the order protection rule, which people always have reverted back to calling uh, the trade through rule. And, and the, the sense there, you know, and it was interesting, you know, Rick talked about archipelago. I mean, the sense was, you know, we now had the ability through technology to go on an order by order basis and to get the best price but not under a system like the New York Stock Exchange had with a floor system. So we had this notion of protected quotes. If you, your quote, your best price in the marketplace would be protected and other, uh, if orders came in through another market, they had to match that price or go to try to seek that protected uh, quote, but only if that, uh, but the order, the quote was only protected if it could be accessed within one second or less. Um, so the notion was that um, we, again, wanted to encourage very efficient price formation. Um, we had lots of markets at this point. We wanted to encourage greater order interaction. And the notion was that you'd have greater order interaction if you would encourage uh, the placement of limit orders and more efficient pricing if, um, if you encourage the placement of limit orders and those limit orders had a better chance of execution and that they couldn't be traded through. There's also a concern, and I know this you know, continues to come up even in the MSAC, the more recent you know, equity market structure advisory committee, you know, when people talk about, about this, you know, who, who, did the, um, who does it really protect? And um, I think the notion was certainly that the trade through rule, um, for the most part, certainly protected retail customers, and we wanted retail customers to be protected. If you looked, I mean, even today, I suspect if you let people trade through, those who might get traded through might be, probably wouldn't be the institutions. Um, so uh, the notion was to you know, provide uh, that protection by ensuring that they got the best price wherever they happened to enter uh, the national market system, they would get the best price either through um, accessing that best price quote or uh, by having it matched. I'm interested in how you and Mark at Reg were thinking about, you, you, you've described the four problems mm -hmm. and the four solutions, and I've heard Reg, and F, Reg NMS described that way too, it's just basically this grab bag. Was there, a, was there a point at which you were thinking that you, were, you wanted to put these things together and you wanted to um, you know, make a rule that was somehow coherent, or was it really just sort of this opportunistic thing described? I think, well, you know, certainly the, the central theme is to improve the markets, but I think they were, you know, we had a great many, uh, we had public meetings, we had, you know, all sorts of um, private meetings. We, we sort of gathered information on what we thought were the issues that were most pressing, and I would say used it as the opportunity to address those issues in one rulemaking. Um, there's not necessarily a, a common theme to all of them, and I, and I don't think there's any question that the, uh, the part that got the most attention was certainly the trade through rule. I think a lot of people sort of forget some of the other uh, uh, elements of Reg NMS, um, but um, uh, I would say that even um, during the, the, the various meetings and outreach that we had with, um, with the industry, the, the most attention was on the trade through rule. Because there was, a, but again, a lot of it was, I'd say trade through rule, it was, it was on, access to markets, it was on linkages. I mean, it was how do you, you know, how do we, how do we access, what, what should be a protected quote, um, that kind of thing, because, um, uh, again, wanted to uh, really further um, innovation in the marketplace, uh, make sure that, uh, that the most innovative players and that technology wasn't being thwarted by, by the SEC's rules. Rick, you would have been looking on at this as a, uh, an industry regulator, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, some of us have, have sort of jumped back and forth between government and various industry regulators, but yes. Uh, you know, first, I think it, since this is the historical society, it's, it's probably good to, to step back for a second and realize just how profound the changes that came out of the order display rule 
uh, decimalization and Reg NMS really were. Uh, that it, essentially you move from an environment uh, where, where spreads were artificially wide to an environment that, that allowed co competition across a wide range of electronic competitors, if you will, high frequency trading. Uh, and that, that you moved into an environment with decimalization where, where rather than simply engage in momentum trading as the market moved, you could more sophisticatedly do a combination of that in market making because the ability to identify momentum moves and, and to step some would say step in front, some would say provide a better price, uh, 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 c continually allowed for the ability for an interaction and suddenly instead of having one market maker, specialist, a few market makers in a variety of different ways, you had the ability for people to compete uh, again, for better or worse, uh, uh, if you, no matter what your access point was and no matter what your capital was in, in, in large partners, log is somebody to sponsor you. So were all those steps absolutely critical to doing that? Not necessarily. Obviously, Europe evolved in a slightly different way and, and got to similar spots. Uh, but it did, it, 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 sometimes it's important to step back and realize just how dramatically it changed the world. Uh, and how it created an environment where, where, uh, where competition, where, where you were operating with dramatically lower effective spreads, uh, but perhaps more challenged uh, uh, co competition from the or activity from the standpoint of institutional investors. Uh, so it was; these were n not small things. They they really did transform the market, albeit doing it in the way that uh, that Rich indicated. Uh, in, in attempting to step away from c competitive barriers and allow competition to take the market where it wanted to go. It, it's probably also important to remember that the, there's an underlying change in the demographics of the market over all of this time, too. You know, if you go back to the pre-war period, uh, so that's much further back than we have been talking, uh, you know, equities were owned by mostly by individuals uh, and it was kind of subsequent to the war world war ii that equities started to be acquired much more by pension plans and retirement plans and the and in going into institutional funds the growth of the mutual fund industry all of those types of things today uh, if we set aside high frequency uh, trading, which may be noise in some ways uh, in terms of the trading activity in the market. Most of the trading volume is done by institutions. Uh, and during this time period that we're talking about, institutions actually had started to pay attention to what the market structure was and how their orders were handled. Uh, academics had been writing about, you know, price impact and slippage and uh, implementation shortfall and all of those types of things and all of a sudden the institutions started to say oh wait it matters that if I trade how big the spread is and where I get liquidity and how I get liquidity and whether or not I move price or whether or not somebody's front-running me and all of that helped to actually motivate this also because we had a lot of institutional backing uh, there were a lot of institutional institutions out there saying this needs to change, this is disadvantaging us, this is disadvantaging essentially their shareholders in the, in the mutual fund space. Uh, so that's, that's an important consideration. And while uh, we're often reminded that the SEC's mandate is protect the individual investor, that individual investor is a smaller share of the market, we have to protect that individual investor in a somewhat different way, I think, than maybe 50 years ago. I think that's a really great point. I mean, there, I totally agree. I think that the institutional investors were very vocal during this process and actually were quite supportive of a number of the changes and were very instrumental in sort of getting, getting this through in a way through their very uh, positive comment letters. Um, and I mean, the other thing is we, you know, we talk about protecting individual investors, which obviously is something the commission cares about, but so much of individual investment today is through collective investment vehicles, mutual funds and the like, which we consider institutional, that there's a, a real blurring there. So the fact that, you know, the mutual funds and the other institutions were, you know, very supportive of these changes and ultimately saw, it, uh, saw the ability to have uh, more competitive markets and, as Rick said, I mean, much uh, 
narrower spreads. I mean, we've, the, I mean, the market, if you really look at what happened in terms of trading after these changes, I mean, certainly there are, there's a lot of unfinished business, but the, um, the spreads narrowed very substantially. The markets are much more competitive than they were. I know you talked about institutional investors' help in getting this through and the, uh, the, the com getting commission approval of NMS, uh, that the process is kind of legendary. What about the challenges of implementation? Uh, were there any wrinkles in that that needed to be ironed out? Well, anything that, any, any uh, change that large would certainly um, take quite a bit of effort. And so I think there was, uh, you know, it's interesting. In, in retrospect, I've heard several uh, market participants say that they, in a way, in retrospect, they're glad that the commission, um, you know, made these changes because they got a lot of um, money for uh, changes to their technology that uh, they might otherwise have sort of taken their time investing in and that that actually had a very positive impact on the market. That wasn't our direct, uh, um, uh, if that, you know, intent, but that, that certainly happened. The, it certainly took time. It, it took a good deal of time, as, as did decimals and a lot of these things. Uh, the, there were, but I think what the commission did that was very sensible was to give people more time, and they, they sort of um, understood that this was a sea change and that it was going to take a lot of uh, coding and, and other, other changes. And I think they were good about forbearing. They didn't bring, in, you know, enforcement cases, if, uh, but rather gave additional time for implementation. So I think we're getting to the point where we can start to hit some of the big questions here, and these can go to the, the whole panel. But we've been ranging between this late 1990s, early 2000s period, and talking about the, the, the fundamental changes that were happening. Maybe the first big question is, why then? What was, what was going on within the, the commission? What was going on outside the commission that, that made this happen at this point in time? Well, I think there were a few things that kind of came together. One, I've already mentioned, technology was blossoming at that time. Uh, I mean, it's hard to think about it today. We're talking 20 years ago, uh, roughly. Uh, but it's hard to think about the, the, how much technology is involved in our lives today and how little there was, you know, then. My daughter says, How'd you talk to anybody if you didn't have the internet and, and text messaging and things like that? She can't imagine that world. Uh, the, but that was starting to blossom at that point in time. The second thing was, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a stumble uh, in the marketplace, uh, which, you know, the NASDAQ market did have uh, at that point in time with the collusion, uh, the avoidance of odd eights. That, you know, helped provide some of the impetus. That doesn't mean that it was easy. Uh, and it doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of people arguing about it. And I think that goes a little bit to the question you were asking uh, a, a moment ago for Annette. But the idea is that you get a lot of noise. A lot of noise comes back with these things. You know, you're going to destroy the marketplace. You know, you're ruining the the refined and wonderful institutions that we have, and you're gonna increase spreads on all, on all those little stocks because we're cross-subsidizing the spread with the, with the spreads on the large stocks. Well, from an economic standpoint, that's a really bad outcome to begin with because you're allocating money to those stocks that shouldn't be allocated to those stocks uh, because they don't support them. Or, you know, you're destroying the IPO market. Uh, you know, I got a lot of that kind of noise when when we did the order handling rules and ATS, et cetera. Annette caught a lot of that noise too with NMS. The same people making the same arguments now on an entirely different thing because it, it sounds good, but you know, you, it's, it's that old adage, you have to follow the money. Uh, almost always that was coming from a particular economic standpoint uh, and people hoping to reverse things that had happened in the marketplace. If you, if you reflect on the number of times in which rule proposals coming out of then market regulation, now trading in markets, were greeted with the fact that Western civilization will end, it would be a fairly long list. Uh, but certainly anything we've talked about today definitely got that. that Rick, I, I, to, to refresh my recollection on some of the NMS issues, I went back and read 
the speech that I'd given, and I made a similar point. I said, you know, that very often when we make proposals such as this, we'll always get letters that say that if you do that, grass will grow on Wall Street. And I said, you know, we need to sort of update the criticism a little bit. At least now you can say they'll turn this exchange into a Starbucks. But, you know, that's, uh, uh, but it's basically the same point. I mean, to make, to, you know, it's interesting when you talk about just how much technology impacted all this, and it was really profound. I mean, I heard recently Drew Files said, you know, at, at Harvard said that she's retiring and that she remembered the week that it was announced that she was going to be president of Harvard, which was only 11 years ago, was the same week that Steve Jobs announced the iPhone. I can't believe that was only 11 years ago, right? So it does tell you just how much things have changed. And we just lose track of time because it all seems so uh, second nature to us now. You know, I would say that the other thing that um, certainly with respect to NMS, that when I've reflected on how did we get that done, and it took a long, I mean, when you think about the process from basically um, 2000, the year 2000 with the market fragmentation concept released through 2005, it was, a, it was a very interesting period in a number of ways. First of all, we had a really, I think, very talented group of people in the Trading and Markets Division. Rich mentioned, um, you know, Belinda Blaine. I mean, we had people who'd really been following this, Bob Colby, Elizabeth King, you know, that I could go on, uh, who really um, had been following these things for a very long time and really understood the issues and were uh, really technical experts, which were the, you were very fortunate to have people like that in the government. We also had, over that period, at least two chairmen who had head, headed exchanges. So you had Arthur Levitt and then ultimately with Reg NMS uh, coming to completion with Bill Donaldson. And they, you know, I have to say market structure, I mean, Rich makes it sound easy. It's very complicated. He makes it, he, you know, it's hard. These guys can, you know, uh, take it down to very simple terms. But it's very complex stuff. And when, when you get these chairmen who come in as, you know, political appointees and they're, they're here for a limited period of time, it's very, diff it's a big lift to address issues like this in the course of their tenure. Um, so having two people who would actually run markets, who really knew how markets operated, it's not a complete surprise to me that it was during their tenures that some of these uh, innovations were affected. I, I completely agree with it, and, and that said, I guess I'll, I'll return to Rich's thing, though. While Annette and the team in trading and markets would have done the right thing no matter what happens, stuff happens does impact the political reaction, et cetera. Uh, and of course, coming before this was the, the issues at the New York Stock Exchange with respect to specialist trading ahead of orders. Uh, that led to a change from Dick Grasso to John Thane, first John Reed and then John Thane running the organization. Uh, somebody with a very different tactical and strategic approach with respect to what the exchange would look like in the next 20 years led to the acquisition first of ARCA and then uh, Euronex. Uh, and uh, it clearly changed the environment when Reagan NMS was proposed that the New York Stock Exchange, while still deeply concerned about it, wasn't uh, flat out and aggressively op opposing it. Uh, and that changed politically from the ability of making it happen made it at least easier. As I say, the decisions of the commission undoubtedly would be done uh, uh, for principled reasons and not based on opposition, but uh, it's always a little simpler. And, and, and the, the changes in the John Thane New York Stock Exchange, as well as the, it, it, the exchange's own self-interest because of its ownership of ARC, et cetera, uh, uh, was also meaningfully changing, changed the dialogue. Well, the, sort of the post-NMS market uh, has made for uh, a lucrative press, uh, but not necessarily good press for the for the commission. We've got flash trading, dark pools, co-location going round and round and round, books like Flash Boys, um, and most of the this sort of standard narrative hinges on the unintended consequences of regulation um, and, and the unintended consequences of the SEC's actions. Can we add some nuance to that characterization? I, the, 
commission always has to take a look at how markets have evolved and look at whether there are unintended consequences. And I don't know any regulatory actions that don't have some. Uh, they also should look at the huge benefits from the standpoint of the, the quality of executions for, uh, for retail investors and institutional investors when they make that decision. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the strength of the Commission over time is its ability to continue to freshly look at issues and markets as they evolve and, and to deliver the expertise that, that's necessary to do that. And I'm confident that this Commission, just as commissions in the past, will do that and respond. Uh, are there issues to look at? Sure. Uh, when order routing de de decisions uh, are, are made uh, from the standpoint of access fees more than, more than anything else, a large part of the time, that, that's worth, as the MSAC suggested, uh, taking a look at. Uh, when all retail order flow essentially in the United States is handled away from exchange markets by a series of large uh, dealer trading firms, that, that has provided a number of benefits uh, to investors, but is perfectly reasonable for the Commission to look at. So, you know, I don't think any of us should say that the, the you know, regulation should never be immutable and it deserves to be looked at, but it, it also should receive the respect of how it's profoundly changed markets in ways that have resulted in, in, in effective spreads that are simply not, not seen anywhere else in the world. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, certainly, um, I think, the term NMS is sometimes used as what the current markets are, as opposed to causality. Um, and so when you look at um, things like you refer to the you know, Flash Boys book and, and co-location issues, again, that's not something that the commission was unaware of. It, it, the book made it seem like this was a new discovery, where you, know, you look in 2010, the commission issued a concept release that talked about issues like co-location and, and recognized that, um, you know, it was something that was occurring and said, is this, is this a problem? Is this something that needs to be addressed? Um, so, you know, again, I think that's not, I, I think that when you don't really understand, you know, what's going on, it's easy to just sort of paint a broad brush. I think sometimes people think that HFT is, is an out, you know, maybe that's an outgrowth of NMS. I don't think, I, I sometimes say to people, well, but doesn't that occur in, in Europe a lot as well? And if that's the case, well, I don't think they had Reg NMS. So I, obviously there's more going on here. Uh, so, um, but having said that, I do think that, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that we have now is it's been quite a bit of time since Reg NMS was implemented. And, um, you know, the markets changed so much, particularly because of things like, uh, you know, the, the fact that we have very, innovative market participants and the, uh, the power of technology and the like. It's, it's incumbent on the regulators to look at these things and, and to update and refine. And it, it, that's really what it all it takes, just refinements, I think, uh, you know, under, you know, being um, consistent with the underlying principles. So I, I do think it's, it's time, and there are, I'm sure, a number of things that uh, we'd all have on our wish list, you know, that could be done to, um, to update Reg NMS. I, I would agree with both uh, Rick and Annette in terms of what they said, and I don't know that I can expound or expand on it very much. Um, you know, something like Flash Boys, from my perspective, you know, the formula for writing a book is that you find somebody to make a hero and you make everybody else the bad guy, and, you know, you write a book that has some truth in it, but is mostly fiction, in my opinion. Uh, so th that doesn't do anything. But most of the things that people complain about in markets, you know, co-location, we had co-location for 200 years on the New York Stock Exchange. We had these guys standing there who could trade before the public, they were co-located. It wasn't done electronically and it wasn't done as tirelessly as computers can operate. Uh, but, you know, it, it was very much the same type of thing. Uh, that was also very close to high frequency trading. You know, we had those bandits that was, uh, that evolved into high frequency. Even the high frequency trading people now you know, are essentially butting heads. You know, they're so fast with the co-located boxes that they actually don't have any priority anymore in their order flow. They, they, they're very fast, but when you get to the, to the nanosecond, the orders actually end up randomized. Uh, 
before they hit the exchange. So you know they're just uh, random, uh, randomly in there. So what's the, the the way to try to fix that? Is you submit a lot of orders that close, uh, you know, which is what we're starting to see in the marketplace. Is that that's the way to try to to get around that? Then maybe you're getting a closing price. You know, personally, I've always been suspect of closing prices because closing prices might represent a hundred shares. They do not necessarily represent what the true price of something is, but of course we price everything based on that. Uh, but you know, it's these problems that are these issues and the way you look at things exist all through time and all through markets. The arguments are almost the same. The people making the arguments are almost the same. It's just cast in a slightly different way because of technology changes, because of structure changes, et cetera. But I agree, the job of uh, you know, trading in markets is to continually evolve with markets. Uh, to, not to shape, not to make the decision as to you know, there should be a club or there should be something else. This is my view. <laughs> but to you know, make sure that the markets are, are kind of fair and competitive and that they evolve on their own. That, I think, is still the best way you regulate markets. And, and I guess I'd like to add, and I totally agree with that, and I'd like to add that I often like to say the reason we need that, I mean, why, why do we need any help at all? I mean, why is the invisible hand not good enough, right? Why do we, why do we need any regulation? The because the visible need, hand is really greedy. <laughs> that's right, because the invisible hand is greedy. There are a number of externalities, just as we started at the beginning and talked about how market participants left on their own will keep all the all the price information, you know, the markets will keep all the price information to themselves. That it is in their interest to act in their interest. And so to have a really vibrant capital market where you have investors who have confidence that they're getting a fair shake, that you have fair and orderly markets, you have best execution, you have efficient pricing, is by having regulation, not heavy handed regulation, not regulation that chooses winners and losers, but regulation that lets everyone operate fairly in an environment where ultimately uh, you know the pricing is is efficient and and where you have uh, investors in your capital markets who want to be a part of it yeah, and I, well, I won't say I agree with everything because it, it certainly is true but in the end if the Commission continues to err on the side of looking closely understanding markets and looking at where there are bar barriers that reduce competition uh, and where there are barriers that reduce in order competition and and evaluate from that standpoint in a way of looking to eliminate barriers and then get out of the way uh, I think that has been the success of this program over a long time and will continue to be let's talk a little bit about um, some of the specifics um, we, we went through a, a, a significant change with ATS and NMS um, and uh, you talked about refining uh, the, the rules as we move on. Uh, markets evolve, market participants are extremely creative. Um, what do you, what do the three of you see as some of the things that are, are coming across the horizon now that will be, need to be dealt with in the next few years or decades because of where we are? You know, one thing that Rich talked about that I don't think we gave much attention here was the, um, the privatization of the exchanges, the uh, and the fact that they, you know, they serve this SRO function, and they, uh, you know, they get market data fees, and they're regulators, and, and you know, there were other parts of that um, analysis that we understood at the time and actually teed up that were never, we never returned to to address, and and one of them uh, was. SRO transparency. And I think a lot of the issues we have today about market data fees and, and you know, how much, you know, and we always said that, you know, market data fees go to, among other things, to pay for the regulation of the markets. And as you know, the markets are now regulated a little differently than they were when, um, you know, when they were not uh, for profit, uh, you know, public, uh, public enterprises. So I think some of that would be, um, opportune, I think, to go back and, and review. And I know that 
in the last several years there's been talk of that. I remember Commissioner Gallagher had talked about that quite a bit. And, and again, without being, without saying what the results would be, I just think it would be very helpful to have a better, you, you can't really, I don't think, have a meaningful debate on some of the issues that are facing the commission unless you have the data to analyze it. And I, I don't think that that's all necessarily available at this point. I, I mentioned access fees before, which I think is great that the commission's be looking at. Uh, but if you want to, you know, th throwing something out in left field, it, I think it's great the commission's now focused on fixed income. Uh, uh, the improvements in equities are in the, in, in the nanoseconds and, and hundreds of a, uh, a penny type issues. Uh, fixed income still about nickels, dimes, and quarters. Uh, and there are real issues both from the standpoint of treatment of retail investors versus institutional investors uh, and generally how the, how the market operates. Although. Uh, with the Commission's help, I think dramatic steps have been made that, that have made that market far better. But uh, I, I think if uh, the next five years would would do uh, more attention to fixed income, uh, even if at the cost of some inequities would be kind of okay with me. Yeah, I, I agree with both those points. I think that, you know, to go to access fees, you know, access fees, of course, partly came about in the order handling rules. And frankly, it was not something that we wanted. Uh, we, we would have much preferred to just say, everybody can access that. But of course, there were business interests uh, where somebody said, well, everybody has to pay to, to belong to our club. Uh, you know, it's not fair. Uh, and recognizing that it probably wasn't fair to take away their revenue at the time was how we got to the access fees. Uh, you know, the fact that exchanges are charging access fees probably is the wrong place. Uh, and, you know, maybe uh, that needs to be revisited in, in, in terms of how that works. Uh, the same type of thing, so I'm thinking of things that we started but that I expected to kind of continue to roll along. Uh, you know, what the threshold was for when you had to start acting more like an exchange and had to do reporting, et cetera. You know, we started with a relatively high threshold, but the idea was that that was supposed to get lowered over time. Those are things that I think the commission should do uh, because it'll incorporate those markets into the entire marketplace uh, more effectively. So, you know, it's, it's all a process. Uh, you know, I would not say that we need to stop where we are today but uh you know we need to just keep keep evolving and keep seeing where the pressures are and where the changes need to, to be made from a historical perspective um 75 act amendments it was congress who told the sec gave the sec the the task of sort of guiding the the creation of this national market system or fostering a national market system uh, and f as we spoke about at the beginning, it took some time for the SEC to kind of step up um, or decide to, to, to become more active there. Do you think we've got the SEC it's, it has gotten as close uh, at this point as it ever has to realizing that, that mandate of Congress clear back in 1975? Who knows what they were thinking about in 1975, and it's probably better not to reflect on it. But the, uh, I think, I, I think w what this story basically is, is the SEC willing to not make perfection be the enemy of the good. And I think on the whole, that's, uh, that's been to the benefit of investors. Great. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I'd like to thank uh, Rick. Rich and Annette, uh, very much for participating. It's been a great conversation. Uh, and it, it's my pleasure to remind everyone that there's a second part to today's program. So at this point, everyone is invited to head out into the lobby for Ice Cream Social to celebrate the Commission's 84th birthday. Thanks again, everyone.